welcome everybody. Wow, we have a great turnout. You guys made it in. That's awesome. Um, I'm Joe, and you probably saw us commenting on the uh, on the meetup page. Um, I co-organized the group with Gideon, who's actually in California right now. We have a new co-organizer, Hendrik. So, cheers. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, welcome to Amazon. Um, we have uh, Russ from yep. Amazon. Going to say a couple words. Yep. So thanks everyone for coming. Um, you really weren't kidding about coming in. I think there's 500 people on the waiting list for this event tonight, which is pretty incredible. Uh, so yes, I work here on the Amazon machine learning uh, data platform. Um, it's a great place to work, and we're doing some really exciting things um, with the Alexa device and the data and the, and the machine learning that goes along with it. Currently in this building, there are 200 openings. Um, so if you find what you hear tonight is really interesting and you really want to work on that type of problem, um, we're at the forefront of it. So we would love to hear from you. Um, if you are a guest here, you have a red badge. If you are an employee, you have a blue badge, like this gentleman here in front, and there are a couple people back there. So please say hi, um, you know, either during the admission or after the event. Um, and we would love to tell you what we're working on and maybe commit you to send over a resume and come work with us. Um, we're, we're a really great group of guys and, and women over here. And we're doing some really interesting stuff. All right, thanks. And I'm excited to hear your presentation today. All right, thanks. Thank you. Cool. Um, so just keep an eye. Just a couple of group announcements. Keep an eye out on the meetup page for for next month's um, event. We're not quite sure what it's going to be yet, but we have a couple things in the work in the works. So without further ado, here's uh, Nicolo, and he's going to talk about automating machine learning. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, this is great. You, you all made it through the rain, you could find the building in the fog. Uh, this is great. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about some recent work on automating machine learning. And I don't know the background of the people here, but I think uh, pretty much here, everyone here should know that uh, if you want to develop a machine learning solution, an AI solution, you usually spend a lot of time tweaking knobs. You swap, try different models, you try different parameter settings, you find try different ways to preprocess the data. And in general, you find that given a specific problem that you cast as a classification or regression problem, maybe a learning to rank problem, you can use many different machine learning pipelines. And by pipeline, I mean a way to preprocess the data, a machine learning model, and the parameters to tune both. Uh, but in general, only a handful of them work well. And it's usually the, your job, or the job of the data scientist, the machine learning researcher, to quickly figure out what works and what doesn't by reasoning about all this space of models, parameters, and so on. So just to give you an example of the process that we're trying to automate, let's say that you want to predict uh, product backorders from historical data. This is a task that a lot of businesses want to do. Uh, nobody wants to order something and find it in back order. Um, let's say that you have sales forecast, you have um, parts lead time, and so on. Um, and usually the data arrives in a spreadsheet or something, or a database. And you know, a data scientist usually starts by trying a couple of simple, simple approaches, maybe reduce the dimensionality of the input data, try some linear model, um, and then maybe move on to more complex models, maybe add some further parameters, uh, tune some parameters, add some additional preprocessing steps, and maybe at the, towards the end of the process to really squeeze all the performance out, you know, move on to uh, deep neural networks, which are controlled, you know, for, for which you have to find the architecture, find different parameters, maybe a dropout, find the dropout probability, and so on. Uh, so but let's say that you figured out in general that you care about deep neural networks or something. You, you figured out a pipeline you're interested in. You still have to usually tune a lot of parameters, and these parameters might make the difference between your network predicting complete garbage or actually having good predictive accuracy. And a lot of people usually hand tune them, or they run very expensive, huge grid sources. Um, and a lot of the time at the GPU cluster at Microsoft is actually spent running these huge grid searches. Uh, what turns out that, aside from grid searches, when you do hand tuning, you find that even people who come up with certain neural network architectures are not very good at tuning them. And this is a very interesting result from, uh, from Jasper Znock and colleagues that came out in 2012. 
And this is kind of the bread and butter of deep neural network research. You're trying to do image classification on Cypher 10. This is something that people have done to death. You know. uh, and you know, humans, you know, typically get an accuracy uh, slightly below 0 0.2. Sorry, an error that is slightly below 0 0.25. And if you let automated approaches tune these networks, you see that the more you let them tune them for, the better they become, and they very quickly surpass human, the human tune, tune network. And this is pretty much irrespective of which automated tuning method you use. And you know, how do you perform inference in that uh, basic optimization framework and so on. What I've found though is that current autom automated machine learning approaches only work in very low dimensional spaces. Only work if you have to tune a small number of parameters. You could have them tune eight, 10 parameters, maybe 20, but it's really stretching. And at that point, you're basically doing the equivalent of a random search in terms of uh, time it takes to find a good model, a good parameter set. And the question that, that I asked myself was why? And, and well, and the problem is that it, these automated approaches tend to treat every data set as an entirely new problem. So they forget everything they learned on previous data sets things that are reasonable, things that humans kind of keep in, in the back of their mind, like learning rates that are, you know, one, E minus one, for instance, tend to be too large uh, for certain batch sizes. If you go to one E minus 50, it's too small, your, your parameters don't move. Uh, you can learn that pretty much irrespective of the data set, and so you want to basically transfer knowledge across data sets. And the way I, I think about it is like Groundhog Day. It's like catastrophic forgetting from one day to the other. Um, well, everybody around you forgets so that, that's Groundhog Day. So, so our solution is really to, obviously, as a, since I identified the problem, our solution is to use different data sets, to learn across data sets. And the goal is to automatically identify good machine learning pipelines, but at the same time also to tune them, so to tune their parameters. Uh, and if you have to remember one thing from this talk, is that matrix factorization plus Bayesian optimization works great. Uh, this might be cultural. In Italy, this means great. I learned that in the US, thumbs up might be better than that. Uh, so replace, mentally replace that with thumbs up every time you see it. You're going to see it a lot. Um, so now I have a very quick introduction of what's the problem that Bayesian optimization tries to solve. So, the goal, in general, when you try to perform Bayesian optimization is to uh, given a loss function and a model uh, and some data x and y, you're trying to minimize a loss. And you're trying to minimize a loss over the parameters theta, uh, hyperparameters. The problem is that usually evaluating this thing is very expensive. And uh, so you cannot, you don't have a lot of evaluations to do that. And the second problem is that usually you cannot even take derivatives. Um, so this is not the typical optimization problem, and you might want to approach it differently, and people have thought about Bayesian optimization as a way to approach this problem. What we're going to deal with in this talk, so the problem that we're trying to solve in this talk is even more complicated than this, and, it's, and it can be expressed as like that. And, uh, and here, uh, we are not trying to just find some hyperparameters of a model, but we're trying to find, yes, the hyperparameters of a model, but the model itself, which model to use, which P, which is the which preprocessing technique to use, and the parameters of this preprocessing technique as well. So here we just went from an optimization space that was hard to deal with already, and we just made it bigger. Uh, but that's that's what you have to kind of figure out. That's the, the problem you want to solve if you want to do machine learning. Uh, sorry, automated machine learning. So there has been a bit of related work in this area. Um, a great paper is by Sarsi and colleagues. In, uh, came out in 2013, they do multitask Bayesian optimization. So the idea is you, you want to uh, train the deep neural network to, to, to do classification on ImageNet. You cannot afford to train 200 uh, networks uh, to fine tune the parameters. So what you do is that you subsample ImageNet. These two tasks are now correlated. You evaluate a lot on the cheaper one, on the subsample ImageNet, and you transfer that knowledge onto the, the more expensive one to evaluate. Uh, this doesn't deal well when you have a lot of uncorrelated data sets. Uh, it's pretty expensive in terms of computational modeling. Uh, the, the time it takes to do inference in this model is pretty expensive, and you cannot do a lot of the tricks that people have done 
to perform efficient inference in Gaussian processes, which is what they use. Um, the second paper is even is, is very closely related, uh, not to Swarovski, but what we want, we want to do. Um, and basically, the idea is that they warm start Bayesian optimization by doing meta learning, and by that I mean they take a bunch of data sets, OpenML data sets that are available, and they compute a lot of uh, meta features, such as the number of classes, the number of features, the number of labels, uh, and then they, um, they given a new data set that they want to do based on optimization on, they search for which data sets are more closely related in meta feature space, and they warm start the Bayesian optimization using Bayesian optimization runs that have been performed in, in those training data sets. So this is a very simple idea. Uh, but it actually was one of the first, I would say, maybe one of the first three true AutoML solutions. Um, and, uh, and it actually won AutoML competitions, I think, at ICML two or three years ago. Uh, it's quite promising. Uh, so here's the key intuition be behind what, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, if you think about this, if you know anything about Bayesian optimization, you usually think about this picture. And if you don't know anything about Bayesian optimization, I'm going to explain it. Um, so Bayesian optimization typically models the response of the loss function again versus one param single parameter that you're interested in as a continuous function, uh, and uses nonlinear regression techniques to model this function and to predict where this function is going to go. And using acquisition functions, which are a way to decide which point to try next, will evaluate one point over the other. So this is a nice picture that works very well when you have continuous parameters, such as learning rates. Uh, so this is my little stylized example of that. Uh, you have a continuous, nice, smooth function that behaves nicely. You can evaluate it at a different point. You can predict, and so on. The problem is, when you really want to do automated machine learning, you have tens of thousands of dimensions. You don't have one learning rate that you're trying to tune. You're trying to tune the learning rate, the momentum. You're trying to learn, tune the number of layers, the type of layers, how many dropout layers. Should you even be using a deep neural network in the first place? Many, many deep dimensions. Some of these dimensions are continuous. Some of these dimensions are categorical. And some of them are conditional on the choice that you've made on another dimension. So if you, on the dimension, which model should I use, you pick a random forest. The, you will have a number of trees dimension. If you didn't pick a random forest, you will not have a number of trees to pick. If you pick a deep neural network, you are going to have a learning rate. If you didn't pick that, most likely you will not have a learning rate too. This is very, very hard to model. And what we kind of decided early on was that this was only giving you a win for continuous parameters. If you have continuous parameters, you can um, kind of use the structure. You can learn a lot about this, the, the shape of this curve. But when you have a lot of categorical and conditional parameters, you only you cannot really learn a very complex nonlinear function from it. You just you just have your one-out encoded categorical variable, for instance. So our solution, which is the, the key behind the rest of the entire talk. So if you don't understand this, just stop me. Is to sample instantiations of pipelines. So we don't even try to model continuity. We just gave up completely, and we discretize the space. And the cool thing is that we can sample as densely as we want. And as long as we evaluate each instantiation of a pipeline in, a, in enough data sets, we don't lose statistical power. So that was the insight behind our approach. Uh, here, I'm showing three examples of instantiations of pipelines. One, for instance, the first one is run PCA, reduce dimensionality to 10% of the original dimensionality, and then apply linear regression. This is pretty trivial. This is, maybe you don't want to, maybe you have too many uh, features, you don't want to overfit, you just reduce dimensionality linearly, and then you do linear regression. The second one is, you first remove the outliers, and then you apply a random forest with a given specified number of trees, and at a specific depth. And then the last one is a DPR network with two preprocessing steps. One is removing outliers, and then renormalizing. So these are three examples. And that's that's the key to our approach. We discretize the space of all possible pipelines. Uh, and the rest, I can give you intuition about. And basically, the way the rest works is it basically is a recommender system for machine learning pipelines. That's all it is. Of course, I'm oversimplifying it a little bit because there is also a probabilistic framework behind that decides, given the predicted performance and the uncertainty about the prediction, what should be evaluated next. So 
in case you're not familiar with probabilistic matrix recommendation, sorry, um, recommender system and probabilistic matrix authorization, <coughs> you are probably a user of it at, at the very least. So Netflix uses it to recommend their movies to you. Uh, and the way they do that is by uh, gathering data from a bunch of users and, and a bunch of movies. They record the ratings given by users to movies. In this case, the, the scale is from one to five stars. And then, given a new user, given that this user has seen a movie and rated it with four stars, you can uh, basically predict and, and de define your uncertainty over your predictions, all the ratings that the user would give to the other movies. Uh, and then when the user watches a second movie and rates it, you can update your beliefs, update your predictions, and become more confident in the case of certain predictions, maybe less confident in the case of others. And similarly, instead of having users and movies, we have data sets and machine learning pipelines. So these are instantiations of these machine learning pipelines that we've been talking about, and these are data sets. And instead of having ratings, we have the accuracies or the AUCs or whatever, met whatever metric you're interested in uh, for all of them. So this is going to be a very sparse matrix. We know that by design because you cannot really afford to run two million pipes on pipelines on 500 data sets in practice. And so the, the task is given a new data set, you want to quickly predict what's going to be the accuracy of all the remaining pipelines. So going back to the, to the culturally contentious slide, um, <coughs> We have this combination of matrix factorization and Bayesian optimization. So the matrix factorization part is really giving us a way to predict. And the Bayesian optimization part, we are actually just going to steal their acquisition function. So that is the part in Bayesian optimization that decides, given this prediction from this model, what, how do I decide what to try next? It's basically a utility function that you can use. So in traditional, just to give you an, an equivalence, with traditional Bayesian optimization, Gaussian processes would typically be in charge of the prediction part, and the utility function from Bayesian optimization would still be in charge of the given, given this prediction of what do I try next. But here we are going to replace it with matrix factorization. So just to, just to state it one more time, we are trying to, given some training data, given some, uh, some performances achieved by different machine learning pipelines on different data sets, we are trying to predict um, what's going to be the performance of the same pipeline, but in a new, completely, completely new data set. So of course, there are many, many ways to solve matrix factorization problems. So the Netflix competition, so Netflix launched a competition, probably most of you know about this. Uh, they launched a competition to try and improve the recommender system. And a bunch of people used um, single value decompositions, and those were one of the most popular approaches at the time. People have also done a ton of work in, around probabilistic methods, such as allocutinate of the means. Uh, we want to stay in the probabilistic setting because we ultimately care about prediction uncertainty. So we want to be able to quantify the uncertainty in our predictions, uh, but we also want a nonlinear approach. So we, we want to be able to first use a, a smaller set of latent variables. We are going to use a latent variable model for this. So we don't want to use linear models that typically require a bit, slightly bigger latent dimensionality. And we want to squeeze all the possible performance out. And we think that nonlinear models will get us there. We also tried linear models, and that confirmed our intuition. So we ended up using Gaussian process latent variable models, first proposed by Lawrence, who's here today, uh, and then refined for the probabilistic matrix factorization task, specifically by Lawrence and Orteson, where they, I think they, they also tackled the Netflix competition task. Uh, and I was struggling a bit on thinking how to present this approach, given that it's not immediately intuitive. And I decided to present it in this term. So you have an observed data space. Uh, and by the way, this slide is also from Lawrence. Uh, you have an observed data space, which is your ratings or your, your accuracies. And you're trying to summarize it with a small number of latent uh, variables. And you, for instance, for the, um, for the recommender system task for movies, you can imagine that the latent variables can capture information about the, the, the users. They can capture whether somebody is more interested in romance, romantic movies, or comedies, or action movies. Or another latent dimension could be their age. Uh, similarly, we think that you can, capture, uh, uh, you can capture what's going on in this matrix of accuracies versus data sets by, with a small number of latent factors, because 
there are a lot of these dimensions in this problem that are actually relevant. So there is a great paper by Bergson and Benjo in 2012 that showed that uh, random search outperforms grid search when you want to tune uh, deep neural networks specifically. And they make a point about the, I think it's what they call it the effective dimensionality. So a lot of these parameters don't do anything. If you spend grid points evaluating the effect of these parameters, you're wasting them. You're increasing the size of your space. You're putting your grid space now has to be huge. You have to, to use many more grid points. And they say you can actually condense down, you can boil this dimensionality down to only the relevant ones. And we think that with the, with the latent variable model where x, the dimensionality of x is much smaller than the dimensionality of y, we can do that effectively. So in our method, there is a nonlinear mapping between x and y. So you basically, here, I'm going to put it, but you can imagine a function that distorts x in a nonlinear way and generates the observations y. And that might be an unfamiliar concept for a lot of people, but you can actually, you have seen it in deep neural networks. So that's basically what deep neural networks do. Like you have observations here have expanded also laterally, just to make it even more familiar uh, for DNN people. Uh, you have observations, but these are the product of many layers, layer after layer of basically simple, let's say, binary units or, or even it works in non-binary cases, but let's say binary units with nonlinear activations. Uh, the activations in this case are very simple, they're monotonic, they're tan H's or rectified linear units, but this is kind of what our approach does. It does one layer only where the function is more complicated than a typical activation function for a deep neural network, and you put a prior, a Gaussian process prior rate, which I'm going to show in the next slide, and you can learn things about it. So here's the graphical model for those of you who are familiar with it. I'm not going to go into very much detail about this slide. Um, the details are in the paper. Here is just to give a flavor of the method to, for people who are interested in it. If, if you want to know more, just come up to me later. Uh, so this is the, the data. So this is where the ratings are, or the accuracies are. And this is the latent space we're trying to infer. Between them, there is this, with this function. This is a very nonlinear function. We don't know what it looks like. So what we can do is we can put a Gaussian process prior. Gaussian process, processes are prior order functions. Uh, you can do very interesting things with them. Uh, you can kind of define which type of function you're looking for. Here, I define this Gaussian process prior by the covariance function, which, uh, which corresponds to a square exponential, or uh, some people know it as a radial basis function, uh, which means that we're looking for very, very smooth functions. This is not a great prior, it's an okay prior. It's probably the simplest nonlinear prior you can put on. And then you can easily get the marginal likelihood by integrating out this, uh, this uh, GP prior over F. So this is kind of, you don't need to understand this like to understand the rest, but this is just a very quick crash course in Gaussian person with variable models, a brutal crash course. Uh, very brutal. But now we have images, so, so that's good. Um, so basically, as you can do in deep neural networks, you can just plot the latent space. The, our latent space is 20 dimensional. These are just two dimensions that we decided to project down to. Uh, each dot is a machine learning pipeline, and uh, the color of each dot is the, um, the accuracy that each pipeline gets on a given data set. So if you had a cluster, and you could run on that for like a month, like we did, um, you, you could color all these points. This is just actually a small sample of pipelines that we consider, but for, it's for visualization purposes. So what's cool is that just giving our method just a matrix of performances on data sets, and we can actually then go back in and we notice that methods, machine learning methods cluster in nice, beautiful Gaussian clusters almost. Uh, so deep neural networks are in that location, comments are not far away, uh, random forests are somewhere between those and linear regression, which is all on the other side of late dimension one. Uh, and the idea is that, of course, like the colors of these points change depending on the data set you're looking at. So, so here's a little animation to convince you of that. And you see that depending on which data set we look at, they change color. And in the case of this last data set, pretty much nothing works except this little blob of I think those are random forests, I don't remember, GPRT, I don't know what it was, but a small number of things work in this data set. So this is the probabilistic modeling. So this is the probabilistic latent variable model. Uh, so that is, that's the first part of the 
equation. Uh, now it's the part that we steal from Bayesian optimization. So Bayesian optimization typically uses Gaussian processes to uh, to model these these functions, but they don't learn across data sets. So we went to a probabilistic uh, matrix factorization framework to do that. But now we get to steal from Bayesian optimization the concept of an, an acquisition function. The acquisition function is something that takes in your predicted performance of a pipeline, the uncertainty over that prediction, and tells you, you should try this thing next. And then after you've tried that thing, you go back, you put in the value, you predict, predict again, and then you ask again the acquisition function, what should I try next? So the acquisition function that we use in the paper is the expected improvement. There is a there is just a slab of math there, but the concept of expect, expected improvement is that you look at the best model so far, the, the performance of the best model so far, and you have a distribution, and then you have basically have a prediction, which is a distribution, the expected performance and the uncertainty over the expected performance, and you're basically seeing, taking both into account, what is the expected improvement over your best model. Uh, if the expected improvement is big enough, you're going to evaluate that. Um, there is also a variant of expected improvement which we are working on, which is uh, which people have suggested, but we are implementing right now, which is called expected improvement per second. The idea is similar. You are taking into account the predicted performance, the uncertainty, and you also predict the runtime of a given machine learning pipeline. The idea being, in earlier iterations, when you have no idea what's going on, you try cheaper models, and then you scale up the complexity as you become more and more confident. So. I have 20 minutes, so I will skip to the experimental setup. Um, we downloaded open, a bunch of OpenNL datasets. OpenNL was a great resource for us. Uh, you can basically, via an API, you can download mo a bunch of machine learning datasets that people have looked at, um, given a few query parameters. We basically downloaded every single classification dataset, both binary and multi-class, that had uh, less than 10,000 samples, I think. That was just to get the paper out of the door. Of course, we can run them more. Um, uh, and we picked 49 of these data sets at random to evaluate our approach. So we basically set them completely aside and never touch them. Uh, and then split every data set in 80% training data, 10% validation, and 10% test. Uh, and then on these, we evaluated 20,000 sam randomly sampled pipelines. Again, 20,000 was pretty much what the capacity of the cluster was. We can evaluate many more. I think now we are around 500,000 on, on more of the most recent experiments. We can go up to millions with no problem. Of course, as I said, we have to be okay with having a lot of missing data in our matrix. So similarly to the movie setting, not every user is going to watch every movie. In this case, we are not going to evaluate every single machine learning pipeline on every single data set. If you have 20,000 pipelines, that, that's even doable. Uh, due to cluster nodes failing and stuff like that, we have 30% missingness. Um, but our approach can deal with the missingness, so that's fine. So we evaluated our approach against basically what we think is the state of the art, which is auto -SK learn, uh, which is the purple line. Uh, we also implemented three baselines. Well, what the most obvious baseline is the random. So if you were to pick one pipeline at random, how would you do? Uh, random is extremely competitive in auto ML settings, in Bayesian optimization. It's known that random works very, very well, often uh, in a, with a fraction of the complexity gets almost, you almost de at the level of very, very well engineered basic optimization frameworks. We also implemented uh, L1. So the concept behind L1 is kind of uh, what I described uh, Autoscale Learn doing. So you, you compute meta features about data sets in your training set and the, the data set you're testing on. And then you basically pick the nearest data set in meta feature space by L1 distance. And then you just try the, the pipelines that work best for that data set in order. So, and then finally was auto -SK learn. Oh, average, basically you try pipelines that work on average well across all data sets. So that's, I put it in because that's something I do. So I would I typically try some linear model and then I try something that works on average well, so, such as a random forest, maybe with default parameters. Um, and then auto -SK learn is this, is this approach that um, basically warm starts the Bayesian optimization. So it does things in a smarter way. This plot shows the average rank. So to walk you through what we did, um, we train on the training set, we, deci we decide which is the best pipeline at every iteration using the validation set, and then we evaluate on the test set. At the test set, we have predictions for all of these five approaches, and we rank them from best accuracy or AUC to lowest accuracy or AUC for each data set. 
So the first one will get a rank one, the last one will get rank five. Uh, we average across data sets at every iteration, so basically on this plot, you want to be <coughs> on the bottom. And PMF is our approach, and we are on the bottom. Uh, random <coughs> starts pretty bad, uh, but then it recovers very quickly. L1 starts pretty well, very well in fact, and then kind of converges to random over time. We think because L1, the very simple idea behind L1 is that maybe the first three or four or five pipelines that work in the most related data set are likely to transfer over to your case, but after that it's pretty much in the noise. Uh, so we were very surprised by the performance of AutoSkillearn. Uh, we spent a huge amount of time trying to figure out uh, what went wrong. We tried with default parameters, we couldn't really understand. Uh, we, they, they do auto-assembling, we disable auto-assembling, we still got that performance, we're still trying to figure out what happened. So average rank plots are, are interesting because they allow you to compare things across data sets uh, pretty much in a, in, in a very unbiased way, but they don't give you an idea of the magnitude of the win. So given that you're transforming things to rank, you're kind of flattening the differences. So we, we also did this immediate regret plot, which basically shows that every iteration, how close are you to the best that you see you can possibly get on that data set. Um, so here the things are much more squished together, uh, mostly because the OpenML data sets are not super challenging. Uh, so we are still on the bottom, you still see that random uh, kind of performs pretty well. L1 performs also well, and the other two methods don't perform well at all. Um, Finally, I also have a small plot that shows that um, things, our, our method is not completely crazy. Uh, one of the keys of our approach is that it should be able to predict how well pipelines work after a small number of observations. So that's the idea behind the plot on the left. Uh, the plot on the left says, given that you have evaluated 0 to 200 pipelines, what's the root mean square on the, all the remaining ones? Uh, so basically, this shows that uh, when you start evaluating things, like when you are at well, 10 pipelines evaluated, you have a root mean square of 0 0.11, which in AUC is not too bad. And then as you evaluate more and more, you, um, you, increase the, you reduce the error. And similarly, um, our model quantifies uncertainty. And what we want to see is that the model becomes more and more confident as it sees more pipelines. So this shows the posterior standard deviation, which is a measure of uncertainty. Uh, and again, you see that there is a sharp decrease in, in uncertainty as you evaluate more pipelines. And in the last 10 minutes, I, I wanted to show you a little demo. So we wanted to do something more challenging than OpenML datasets, so we actually went on Kaggle. We downloaded this little, uh, well, it's not little, it's pretty big. Uh, this dataset, can you predict uh, product backorders? It's the data it was talking about in the beginning. Uh, comes in a massive Excel spreadsheet. Um, it's a mixture of um, continuous features, categorical features, and so on. Um, so here's the notebook that actually we had to come up with to, to, so, to uh, participate. Well, it was not a competition, it was a data set, but to analyze the data set, you can basically, if you remove all the data loading code, you're left with two lines of code, and that's all you need to run our approach. Um, <laughs> Which is pretty cool. Uh, so, so here is a little animation. Um, on the top, we have, you have the prediction accuracy versus the number of machine learning pipelines evaluated. So, the idea on this plot is you want to be as high in accuracy as soon as possible. You don't want to spend time looking at things that don't work well. The red line is, to the best of our knowledge, it, it's a combination in fact of our own efforts to find a good machine learning pipeline manually and efforts that we found on Kaggle, just by looking at people's notebooks and <coughs> implementing them. On the bottom two plots, you have a latent space plot, like the one I showed you before, and just in this case, we have many more pipelines, because, um, because this is the actual full set of pipelines we consider. This is not for visualization purposes, this is a real deal. Um, that is the predicted performance. So that shows how well we predict each pipeline, so each dot to work. It starts at, I think, zero, no, no, at 0 0.5, just because it starts at random. Uh, so before we've seen any data, we just think everything works at random. And the other plot is, shows the uncertainty over the predicted performance. So it starts at 1, which is the maximum, so we are very uncertain about everything. 
uh, as this moves on, as the optimization moves on, you'll see it become darker and darker. Uh, as I said before, thanks to the acquisition function, we take both of these things into account when deciding what to try next. So now I can start the animation. You see that the first pipeline that, oh yeah, sorry, back. Uh, I'm going to mark with a red cross the model we are evaluating, the pipeline we are evaluating in the given iteration, and then with a red circle, the best found so far. And if you focus on the bottom two plots, you will see that the, our model focuses on these frontier models. We think these are good frontier models to focus on. Uh, these ones don't work well, and so you will never pretty much see the red cross go there. Uh, so now I started. The first pipeline didn't work well, but from the second onwards, we're beating ourselves and, and other people. And you see that it keeps refining it and refining it. It's exploring these nice frontier of good models. It's becoming more and more confident about it, so darker and darker. Of course, it spends some time in others, just because it has to get an idea of what happens in that neighborhood. But it mostly fine tunes stuff around here. Basically, the idea is that you can let it run more and more, and it will squeeze more and more performance, assuming that something close to the model that generated the data is in, is in the set of models we consider. Uh, so yeah, so that was the demo. So this is a uh, joint work with Melly, who's here somewhere. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, especially about the modeling aspects of it, the paper, we just put the paper on archive. Uh, and that's it, thank you. All these different models had all different loss functions. Is yeah, correct? potentially. Yeah. Okay. For the ones that you tested. It, so yeah, you, so you know, you, you loss functions to train with, you mean, or to yeah. evaluate. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. And so, all these different pipelines. So, how do you come about generating them? That's a so we went work. well, pretty much exactly. We went through the scikit-learn manual. And we included every single classification uh, as a standalone. As a stand, well, we, we combine them. We, oh, we, we take a Cartesian product. That's, okay. that's what you're asking. So yeah. we we take we generate a list of preprocessing steps. We make them. Uh, for example, PCA. We make it such that you can. It's data set independent. So you don't say PCA with ten dimensions. You say PCA with one percent of the dimension. So it's actually, it's relative to the size of the data set. And then we have a generate a list of models. And we take the Cartesian product by sampling uh, a pipeline, a preprocessor, and a, and, a, and a model. Did you try? I don't know enough about tops, but did, did you try other uh, auto ML approaches? Uh, other than uh, auto skill learn, That's good. we tried. So uh, we tried hyperopt for the things we could use it for. Hyperopt does this very smart early stopping of things that are unlikely to work when you when you have things that work by iterations. So that's not all the models we consider, not all the models we consider. We also, I think, tried uh, Spearmint to convince ourselves that if the space was too large, Spearmint could just, couldn't handle it. Uh, I think that was it. Yeah. But that's just on the Bayesian optimization. What? Spear, both Spearmint? Yeah, well, and what, or you, or you mean like Teapot and stuff like uh, yes. genetic algorithms? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, we also tried Teapot. Um, we couldn't get it to work really. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hope you're not one of the authors. No, no, no. <laughs> you saved me a lot of time. This was <laughs> yeah, so if, if you're on Reddit machine learning, there is a thread in which there are a bunch of people saying, hey, what's the state of the art in automated machine learning? 50% of the comments are, this doesn't work. <laughs> which is great. Like it's, That's why we do research. Like, you know, it's good to know that it's uh, there are data sets that are specific to the auto ML competition that took place as part of ICML. Did you try it against any of those data sets? No, we are trying to keep them as untouched as possible. So touched when we are completely happy with the set of pipelines that we have, we can just evaluate them. Okay. Uh, we are, that's why we are looking at Kaggle, just because we don't mind touching Kaggle a few times, but we want to keep the auto ML competition on its own. Um, your performance graph uh, indicated it's like a pretty much vertical line. I know. Uh, right? yeah. <laughs> uh, That's why it like has a demo. Labeled, so about how many uh, pipelines was it attempted before it jumped up to? No, no, it's just literally one. What's that? Literally it's, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, that's point one, that's point two. Yeah. 
So that's why that's why we show it. I mean, okay. we don't. No, I'm joking. But it's uh, uh, the, no, it's uh, it's it's pretty interesting. You can very quickly figure out, you know, what, what works. It's it's very interesting. Uh, I I would say that it's if we showed the, the equivalent prod for RL1 methods or baseline, it would have also done something like that. Maybe it would have started higher even. Uh, but we see that it just squeezes more and more. So that's pretty interesting. And that happens even for complex tasks. We, we recently did the flight delay data. I don't know if you know about it. It's uh, 10, I think 10 million samples of flight delays. You have to predict whether a flight is delayed or not. It's not super easy to predict it. We did regression in an earlier paper with Neil. Uh, we treat it as a classification problem. We got way better performance than I think <coughs> most things I could think of. So <laughs> that was pretty good. Uh, we'll let this yeah. And then I also should go to this side. How long does this process Sorry? How long does this process take? Uh, that's a huge data set. So each dot you see takes at least a couple of hours. But that's mostly in, in the time it takes to train the model. Our model, the predictions are very, almost immediate. It's very, very quick. We, in fact, we have a nice client-server architecture that just serves which model you should try next. Um, so the, most of the time is taken training the machine learning model that you actually care about, not our method. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Could, uh, could you give us a little more details on how do we choose the data sets and how do we choose subsets? Of um, the data sets, like from OpenML, you mean? Yeah. Uh, that was exactly as I described it. We literally filtered, we basically said we want everything that has no missing, anything that has no missing data, less than 10,000 samples, and its classification. I'm sorry, when you are, when you're doing the optimization, you have data sets also, right? When I do this the, part? The pipelines, yeah, pipelines against various data sets, right? Yes, those are from the OpenML data sets. Right, so, so you choose from the same data set, you have one big data set from which you chose subsets, right? Uh, are, you, are you trained it on? Those oh, for each, you mean for each, like for each column, for each that's data set, that's how right. do we split it? Right. Oh, at random. Oh. So we just take 80%, 10, and 10. And in newer versions, we do cross validation so instead of splitting in train and validation. Can you explain the rationale of how you went about choosing like those filters for the data sets? Um, like, oh, like ten thousand, like why ten thousand? Uh, yeah, no, that's that's a good question. There is the rationale was just that we really wanted to have something in time for our paper submission. Uh, <laughs> so, so this is the thing. We where the SVM is in there. So, those things. As soon as the model eats an SVM, it will just stop for two hours and just run forever. We had ways to stop things that took longer than 30 seconds, which allows us to actually, in particular, to compare to what is learning, which does the same. But that's basically, the, the idea was we were wanted quick evaluation, just for the sake of our initial experiment. Right, so if you would want to implement it in, let's say, a field setting, then what does, what do you think needs to change? Or, or what approach would you take? Uh, I think for the, I think this is practical for real, pur for real purposes, I think, uh, when we deal with, with, with huge data sets, we typically even ourselves do subsampling. So we launch a few instances of this thing in parallel to, to just, and just find uh, what works and what doesn't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering how ready this, um, everything is for, like, I don't know, us to use because like I'm thinking, oh, I already have something where I'm like, I would love to see this used, and I was wondering kind of how available that is. Uh, that's a big question, yeah. Um, I guess, ask me again after NIPS. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we, we, are, we are going to have a version out. Uh, there is a bit of this problem, this thing learned from every data set that it sees, so we don't want, right. so, we are happy to release the OpenML version. We have a lot of stuff that depends on internal data sets we cannot release. Um, so, but, but this is the OpenML version that works pretty well. So we're going to, I think, once the paper comes out, release this. Thank you. Uh, I have a really question to the previous one. So this is optimizing for performance. But how is runtime of the models taken into, um, is, is it considered? No, that's, that's a great question. We are doing it now. So. 
basically on, on this on the bottom here we are just counting the number of pipelines we are we basically are generating similar plots with number of seconds uh, so there is a simple <laughs> modification to the expected improvement function you can do expected improvement per second it's great because at that point you destroy random because random tries different pipelines irrespective of how long they take so you might spend two hours evaluating one once you factor in the improvement per second first of all our framework without modification you just replace performances like AUCs with uh, run times, and you can predict the same thing pretty well. Um, so we are basically doing that. We are training two models, one on run times, one on performances, and we are combining. So uh, what kind of um, run time to data, data set size uh, correlation is there? I mean, what part is scale? Well, so for this is the thing. It doesn't. Our approach doesn't really depend on that. Our approach, the runtime of our method, depends on the number of <coughs> pipelines that you try. So after, I would say after 800 or 900, we start slowing down uh, cubically. Uh, well, you know, we start slowing down cubically at one, but but it, they don't feel it. Uh, so you know, I would say it's practical in that term until 2000. I would say, uh, but to your point, that depends on which. Uh, pipelines you want to consider like the base um, the base models you want to consider so that depends on on the data set on how you build your library of models and so on yeah yeah can you just say when you were looking at the data set cleansing part and when you were looking at the misguided values so what percentage did you you know neglected the data when you had missing value in one column or like column name which, okay, what do you mean by neglected data percentage? Like when you have the data set, when you have many parameters like columns, so the, you might have some missing data, and then you have to cover it with columns. What amount, what percentage of the data, like the column name, you actually neglected or otherwise included in your analysis? Mm, I'm not sure I get the question, but uh, so you're, you're basically you're saying you have this giant. Let me see if I can go back to it. You're basically asking me in this slide. Yeah. Oh, you're saying how many of these empty cells do I have? Yeah. Oh, okay, so uh, the <laughs> stuff we did, for the experience we did for the paper is 30%. So that's not a huge amount. It's pretty densely sampled. Of course, now that we've increased the number of pipelines we consider, we cannot afford to run 70% of the experiment. So now we have, I think, I'm looking at maybe 20 percent, the 20 percent uh, non missing, so it's 80 percent missing. Okay. Um, I believe uh, there are parameters within the medium condition, so do you guys yeah. take that? No, it's great, yeah, it's knobs all the way up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we did random. Oh, that's that's my timer. Um, uh, we did a random search for those. Uh, uh, we basically took like a small number of data sets that we never touched again, and we fine tuned the parameters on those, and then we transferred to the bigger set. So just random search. But that's because we had five parameters to find, not many. So that's why it worked. Nothing, we have an HPC cluster. Uh, I think we use like quite a few nodes, like 20,000 nodes for a while. <laughs> you know, it's not, not super environmentally friendly as a project. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a type of data that just refused to work with? Um, not that I can think of. I mean, it's hard to define refuse to work. Uh, this is a thing because because you have to kind of co either you compare to humans and and uh, I guess we have a few internal data sets that I've looked at where we didn't beat the human but the thing is we let this thing run overnight and we match the human so we still have to find maybe we don't have the challenging data sets yet I would well, let me put it this way actually if we were to do image classification with deep neural networks we wouldn't beat the state so that ju that just occurred to me. Yeah, this is like for you know the typical classification tasks or simple image tasks, stuff like that. We're working on the neural networks. So. Is the pipeline uh, 
recommendation consistent with that more data sets to it, in the sense that are there consistent winners in the pipelines? That's a question that people have asked me before. We haven't looked at it just because we were running so many experiments that we want to be efficient with the way we store data, and now we can almost not read it anymore. So we are going to do that, as I guess, soon and figure that out. Oh. Since nobody's asking, uh, did you, so did, in your experiment, did, did any particular model or a set of models come out winners? Um, yeah, that's what I think you just asked. Uh, yeah, we don't know. We haven't looked at that. But we definitely want to. Yeah. yeah. So, um, my understanding that training data is actually from open data. Nothing related to the data set. Nothing related to? So the, the, the data set an example that you're talking about? No. Yeah. No, the OpenML is just, yeah, the data set from OpenML are the UCI diabetes example, the uh, breast cancer one, you know, example, stuff like that. Uh, no, 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 well, the, the recommender system, yes, but the base models, no. Like the base models you have to train on each instance, of, on each problem you care about. Oh, like it has a, it, yeah, for a new problem, you don't know where to start. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 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 no, that's, yeah, that's true, that's, that's a problem. Um, the pro we found that the cool start is a problem for the first or the second, and then after that, we get a pretty clear est estimate of the posterior, the predictive posterior. So we get, we get more and more confident, of course, but we get a good idea what works. So if you take the correlation between our predictions and the actual performance of each pipeline, we are pretty well correlated already starting at iteration two. Of course, it improves over time. Uh, yeah, were you limited to just sklearn kind of models, or did you use other? So I think it was auto sklearn and XGBoost. <coughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now we're expanding. Now we're using a bunch of But that was pretty much covered it, though. It, there is a lot. How does it perform when you reduce the training set to 80% and 20%? Uh, we haven't tried. We haven't tried. Uh, that's, I guess it will be, you know, there are the error, you can decompose the error, and, uh, and I guess it will increase the variance a bunch. Uh, we keep all the bias that we have, but yeah. I will. So a regime where I would expect things, everything to be universal work poorly is, is this you know, sort of small and small sample size. So it would be interesting to understand how that landscape changes. It. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we are we are doing experiments like that to understand how subsampling the data affects the model. So that's I guess that's related. And what's kind of interesting about this late space representation is is that. He's taking sort of discrete space and it almost makes it semi continuous. Yeah. Well, it's not the space is is discrete uh, in the way we sample it, right? But the 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 data comes as continuous to the model. So this matrix this matrix is continuous, right? It seems like there's almost like a pseudo gradient information. Yes, yes, there is. That, that you, you can leverage in a way that would be difficult if you were Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a good point. Uh, you don't need preprocess. Uh, you mean of this data? Yeah. Uh, well, well, you need it to be on the same metric. So, if this is a matrix of AUCs, you need to be computing AUCs here. But other than that. Uh, with the AUC, we do some processing that makes makes it such that if something is below random, it gets snapped back to random. But other than that, it's that's that's all. Let's take uh, just a couple more, so like two more. <laughs> Thanks for. <laughs> I was not sure how long I should. Yeah. Uh, I think there was somebody there. Yeah. So if you let's say you know you had as much computing power as you wanted, 
and you could just do grid search or some type of other brute force approach. Yeah. Would you eventually get to the same uh, solution that you end up the same performance, or is it that okay you're adding you're adding dimensionality? You have so many spaces. It's practical. No, no, absolutely. With infinite compute, you, if you did random, if you did grid search, it's not guaranteed you would find yeah. uh, as good a solution. In fact, it's pretty much guaranteed you wouldn't uh, in high dimensional spaces. But if you did random search, yes. Uh, if you let random search run forever on a finite set, because it's a set of pipelines we consider, you would get the performance by definition. The top performance. Probably even better than we do. But it might be a factor of what? How much longer? Uh, that's a good question, actually. We should just let random search go on for a long time um, on one interesting data set. I don't know. It's a, it's very data set dependent because you want to basically, you need to compute the probability of getting a performance that is higher than ours. And that depends on the distribution of the performances of all the pipelines in that data set. So for some problems, you see that it's a distribution that is super skewed to performance one, so that's trivial. In some data sets, you see that it's super skewed to performance random, so that's very hard. Uh, so it's very data set dependent. And I, I think for trivial data sets, it might happen within five iterations. In very complicated one, it might happen after you basically sampled everything. And then there is one. Um, have you found any uh, interpretation of the latent variables? Uh, for example, like um, understand, understand what kind of data set work better with this uh, model? No, that's, that's a great, great question. Mm -hmm. So I think next, next first, and it just occurred to me too when I was talking. First thing tomorrow morning, we should try and regress uh, data set meta features. Oh, no, no, sorry, pipeline meta features on the latent space and see if we can find correlations there. Uh, but no, we haven't looked at that. Yes, since I, I think this is a very potentially very good tool for us to find some, some insight. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I can make an end wavy argument about this. Um, I, you know, in my, in my mind, latent dimension one seems to capture degree of nonlinearity of the model. Uh, I don't know why confidence would be on that axis before the dependent answer, but, but it's, it's a hand wavy argument, so uh, who knows. Uh, I guess I should regress model capacity on, on latent dimension one and see. All right, uh, let's thank Nico one more time. Uh, we'll post we'll post a link to the paper and, and I think the slides. If that's okay. Yep. And uh, we'll have the video as well. So thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>